Hello and uh, good evening. Uh, welcome everyone to this inaugural DD Kosambi lecture of the uh, ICTS. Uh, most of you, I think, are familiar with the ICTS. So, <laughs> so uh, the uh, ICTS is the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, as most of you know, and uh, our institutional philosophy uh, is of science without boundaries. And uh, of course, from them, it's a, a simple analytical continuation to thought without boundaries. And um, uh, Didi Kosambi, about whom you will shortly hear from uh, Spenta, uh, was a remarkable polymath. And uh, in that very spirit, uh, so ICTS thought it very appropriate to honor his legacy with this series uh, it's, uh, that we are starting. It aims to be, it aims to provide a platform for an engagement of the sciences as represented at ICTS with the broader thoughts from the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, and uh, this is an engagement of the kind that Kosambi very uniquely pursued uh, uh, in a sense, uh, at an individual level by himself, uh, and uh, that tradition or that, uh, 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 or I should say that spirit is in danger of being forgotten. Uh, and we thought at ICTS, we would try in our small way to, uh, uh, to rekindle that. So, uh, so this, uh, this lecture is in that spirit. I'll now invite Professor Spenter Wadia to uh, give an introduction to Didi Kosambi. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, it is for a few years now that uh, here at ICTS we have been wanting to uh, hold these uh, lectures, Kosambi lectures, as a regular feature. Uh, and uh, I think the uh, first question is why Kosambi lectures at the International Center for Theoretical Sciences? So, as you know, the three main missions of ICTS are mainly centered around the natural sciences and mathematics. So this is basically an institution for natural sciences and mathematics presently. The Kosambi lectures will afford an opportunity to expand our vistas and engage in other branches of knowledge, some using the methods of science outside the traditional natural sciences, and some that are related to the arts and humanities, as these two have played and continue to play an essential role in the development of our species. Damodar Dharaman Kosambi was born on July 31st, 1907 in Kosben in Goa. His early education was in Pune and then at Harvard University where he graduated in 1929. Returning to India, he worked as a mathematician at BHU, AMU, and at AMU on the recommendation of Andre Vail, Ferguson College in Pune, and TIFR, uh, which he joined in 1946 on the invitation of Homi Baba to build a mathematics department at the TIFR. After TIFI in 1964 onwards, he was CSIR Emeritus Professor at the Maharashtra Association for the Cultivation of Science, and he passed away in 1966 at a relatively young age of 59 years. Kosambi considered himself first and foremost as a mathematician, and he was a well-regarded person in that community. He was one of the foundation fellows of the Indian Academy of Sciences on the invitation of C.V. Raman. He served as a member of the International Mathematical Union. This is the committee that awards the Fields Medal in Mathematics. The other members of the committee at that time were Harald Bohr, Lars Alfors, uh, Maurice Frechet, William Hodge, Kolmogorov, Marston Mose, and others. Besides his work in pure mathematics, and I use this word pure mathematics because of, a, because of a lack of a better way to say it, Kosambi had a very open mind and he did not hesitate to learn about discoveries in the natural sciences. 
He made contributions to genetics where he introduced the Kosambi mapping function. He also weighed approximately 7,000 coins, undated old coins, and applied statistical analysis to this data, his data, to ascertain their dates. But there is more. Kosambi applied the scientific method, and if you want to know very lucidly, the scientific method was explained by Professor David Gross uh, in this January uh, when he came to speak here at the celebration of the ICTS at 10. So it's on the website. So I really invite you to uh, listen to that talk of his. Is what is the scientific method? So Kosambi applied the scientific method to the study of ancient Indian history. Now, he adapted. <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't want to say adopted, he adapted the method of Karl Marx to the study of human history. And as you all know, this is the 200th birth centenary of Marx that is being celebrated the world over. Marx chose to describe the time development of human society in terms of a certain set of variables or observables. Adapting Marx's theory to this problem of Indian history Kosambi, in his book, The Introduction to the Study of Indian History, says, and I quote, history is defined as the representation in chronological order of successive developments in the means and relations of production. Why is this a useful way of describing history? Is it adequate? Is it predictable? We will not go further into a discussion of this question except to say that viewing history in terms of certain variables is a truly profound and revolutionary contribution of Marx. And adapting it, Kosambi established the foundation of the scientific study of Indian history, which has had a profound influence on modern Indian historiography. Now, since many of you are students of science, you will appreciate the above point of view quite easily because you all know that the description of the dynamics of simple and complex systems, including complex networks, which we are, requires the use of the right type of observables to answer the relevant questions you may be interested in. And finally, by naming this series after D.D. Kosambi, we also honor the memory of an extraordinary Indian who integrated various strands of thought and method to understand Indian culture and society and India's past with the aim that such an understanding will help uplifting the lives of the masses of the people of India from hunger, poverty, and backwardness. Thank you. So, um... It's a thank you, Spenter, for that uh, introduction to uh, uh, to, uh, to Kosambi and his work. Uh, it's now my very pleasant task to introduce to all of you uh, uh, our inaugural Didi Kosambi lecturer, Professor Prasab Banu Mehta. Uh, he's one of India's very distinguished academics, uh, but unlike m uh, most academics, he's engaged in the public sphere on critical issues related to Indian democracy and its practice. And he has also recently taken on a leadership role uh, as the vice chancellor of Ashoka University in bringing together science and humanities in a broad-based education, uh, something which is all much lacking in India. He was previously the president of the Center for Policy Research. Uh, as a political scientist, he has taught at Harvard University and the New York University School of Law and briefly at JNU. He has published widely in political theory, constitutional law, society and politics in India, governance and political economy, and uh, international affairs. Recent publications include as editor of the Oxford Handbook of the Indian Constitution, the Oxford Companion to Politics in India, Rethinking India's Public Institutions, Navigating the Labyrinth, India and Multilateralism, he was also part of the collective that produced Non-Alignment 
He has served on many uh, national committees, including India's National Security Advisory Board, the Prime Minister of India's National Knowledge Commission, and a Supreme Court appointed committee on elections in Indian universities. Uh, uh, he, many of you probably know him from his editorial columns in the Indian Express, uh, where he's an editorial consultant, and his columns have also appeared in other dailies, including the Financial Times and the International Herald Tribune. Uh, uh, Professor Mehta holds a BA first class in uh, uh, philosophy, politics, and economics from Oxford, and a PhD in politics from Princeton. He received the 2010 Malcolm Adisheshaya Award for Social Sciences and the 2011 Infosys Prize for Social Sciences in Political Science. So, uh, so, uh, but I must add, from a personal point of view, I have long admired uh, uh, Professor Mehta and his writings. And uh, uh, I, I recall when I came back to India um, more than 15 years ago, uh, I, I came across a very slim book of his called The Burden of Democracy, which, uh, uh, which in a way, um, uh, which I would encourage many of you to read. It's, uh, it's a very accessible book. Uh, uh, it crystallized for me many insights in very incisive ways. Uh, and I, I was particularly struck by something he had mentioned. I mean, but there were many things that struck me in what he, in that little sort of uh, long essay. Uh, but um, uh, he mentioned three challenges facing Indian democracy, and I quote, one, the challenge of creating moral norms that provide the basis for a decent society. Two, the challenge of resisting an apocalyptic politics of self-esteem, which characterizes so much of Indian politics. Three, the challenge of making citizens work together to produce policies they could all freely accept. So these challenges remain even now, 15 years later, perhaps with even more urgency today. Uh, uh, so, Professor Mehta, I welcome you to ICTS, and uh, I'm delighted you're here today for this special occasion. Thank you, Professor uh, Gopal Kumar and uh, Professor Vadia for that very warm uh, welcome. Uh, and I must confess, I think this is probably the most intimidating occasion I've ever faced, and I've faced a few. Uh, Intimidated for three reasons. One, this is an extraordinary uh, institution, and just I think seeing the people uh, 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 present in this room, um, you know, makes makes one feel truly uh, humble. Um, but the two more kind of proximate reason. One is a kind of excuse. This is like a little student kind of, you know, uh, uh, coming to a teacher and sort of uh, giving an excuse, which is I discovered much to my horror when I went to my room at three o'clock that <laughs> the the final lecture text, which I thought I had with me, I, I didn't. So I'll improvise a little bit. Um, but most importantly, and more intellectually seriously, um, I was reckless enough to accept the invitation to deliver the Didi Kosambi Memorial Lecture. Uh, and it's an act of recklessness on my part because um, obviously engaging with Didi Kosambi's work and the themes that he wrote about is beyond my academic competence. Although I have read, I think, almost everything Kosambi wrote, uh, uh, at, least in, at least in English. And the questions that I wanted to raise about Kosambi's work uh, certainly take me into, as you'll see in the next few minutes, uh, slightly more complicated territories of religion and philosophy, uh, which again, I may not be the best person to kind of uh, uh, engage with. But I decided to accept this invitation uh, in any case because I thought it would provide me an occasion and to not just learn from you, but to try and come to terms with what Kosambi's historical legacy has meant for Indian cultural life. And you might say, why is that particularly important? Yes, Kosambi was a great polymath. Yes, Kosambi was a pioneer in so many different fields, from genetics to numismatics to you know physics, mathematics. Uh, uh, Kosambi is widely read in Indian universities, but really is Kosambi a figure of major cultural significance? Okay. 
And let me just throw out a kind of opening proposition, which I'll try and explain in the, in the, in, in the course of this talk. Uh, many of the students here are probably too young to remember what Kosambi meant for historiographical debates in India. And, but even if you look at the contemporary moment, let's say you look at the debates between broadly people who identify themselves on the intellectual right with Hindutva and historians from JNU, just to take a, a more immediate contemporary example. Right? A uh, lot of these debates are not very edifying. A uh, lot of the drivers of these debates are not very intellectual. Uh, right? Nevertheless, these are debates with profound stakes for Indian politics. But if you dig deeply, right, if you go to the source of these debates, right, and ask the question, right, why is so much of the politics of Hindu nationalism so anxiety driven? Right? And I'll explain all of these terms in a minute, but I think it's a cultural phenomenon you'll recognize. I'm simplifying a bit, right? One surprising answer you may come to is that it has to do with the legacy of Didi Kosambi on Indian cultural life. When the right is attacking Romila Thapar, they really mean to attack Didi Kosambi. Romila Thapar is an easy, convenient target. They mean to attack Didi Kosambi not just, right? As, and obviously he's a Marxist historian, he never hid that fact. That was his conception of what a scientific history looked like, right? And I'll talk about that uh, in a sense a little bit, right? But I think they saw in the approach that Didi Kosambi took to not just history, right? history understood as in, you know, explanation of uh, material facts, economic history, political history. But what they saw in Didi Kosambi was a, you might say, a danger to the whole idea of Indian intellectual history itself. And what I'll try and do over the next few minutes or so is try and kind of explain what the, what the nature of this danger is that they think and why we need to both take on board right, a lot of what Kosambi contributed to the study of history, at least the methods he brought to bear in the study of history, right? but nevertheless try and explain why we are deeply anxiety ridden. Right? precisely because of what Kosambi did, right? Uh, just to kind of begin, I mean, just again, in kind of random, just to set the context. Uh, one of the books, if you ever have time, if you, if you, if you want to read, I, it's, a, it's a difficult read. Uh, the, in English translation, it's available only in fragments. There was a North Indian politician, Saint Karpatre. Many of you may have heard of him. Uh, one of the few kind of genuinely reactionary thinkers we produced. And I use the words both advisedly because often reactionary and thinkers can be an oxymoron. Uh, he was a genuine, genuine, genuine thinker uh, who wrote a book called Marxism, Marxvad or Ram Raj. Marxism or Ram Raj, right? It's 400 pages. Uh, it's one of the few sustained attempts by the right to actually engage with Marxism, as opposed to just saying Marxists are a bunch of atheists, let's just get rid of them, end of story, right? Okay. Uh, and Marxists do the same to others sometimes, so uh, I guess they even out. One of the few sustained attempts, right, to actually work through Marx's arguments, right? And what was interesting about this book, and why this is a serious book in some ways, that it wasn't just an engagement with Marx, it saw Marx as a kind of culmination of a scientific approach to society and history, right? 
that begins with Hobbes in some ways. And so, so there's the construction of, you might say, a materialist tradition of inquiry. And the basic framework, to put it very simply, was that history is available to scientific determination only if you see history as an ensemble of material forces, right? Because only then there is an object that you can actually study, and it's an object that will have at least some invariance about it, right? It doesn't simply act in change in the act of your interpreting it, right? Yeah. And what Karpatra argued in some ways, right? This is the this is the gauntlet we throw down, down. Was that if modern Hinduism or Hinduism again? We can talk about what he means, but let's, let's just use it as a placeholder at, at, at the moment. If Hinduism and Hindu intellectual traditions were to have any place in the modern world, right, any intellectual legitimacy at all, right, fundamentally, they would have to engage with and overcome the legacy of Marxism and this materialism. Okay. And this is not an unfamiliar argument. I'm sure many of you think this is so intuitively obvious, right? But, but I'm just kind of underscoring this point to kind of show the ways in which this question, right, actually becomes a central question in North Indian politics. Remember, Karpatra is one of his other kind of big political feats was to oppose Nehru on the Hindu reform code bill. He was actually the main spokesman opposing Nehru on the Hindu you know, reform code, code bill, right? Now, one of the arguments that I'm going to make today, and this is, this is you know, it just, just kind of way of conclusion, then we'll go through a couple of steps to get there, is to argue that the kind of crisis that you see generated in, in intellectual life, Indian public life, by Hindu nationalism, right, has to be understood at two different dimensions. There's one dimension that we normally talk about a lot. That's what we write as political scientists about. That's our scientific approach to politics, the bread and butter of politics, which is what you might say the purely political anxiety around Hindu nationalism, right? Um, which is, is there a political project that we can describe as Hindu nationalism that we think is going to put at risk, right? what we broadly think of as liberal constitutional values, right? Now, as a political project, right, fundamentally Hindu nationalism is characterized by, I think, just one core anxiety, and that core anxiety is something that you might call demographic anxiety, right? What do I mean by demographic anxiety? Demographic anxiety in this particular constellation of Hindu nationalism, right, takes the following form, which is, it sees three particular threats, right, to, as it were, the creation and maintenance of what you might call broadly Hindu interests, right? And all three are, in, if, you, if you scratch the surface, are fundamentally demographic, right? The first is the threat of conversion, right? And one of the challenges for, let's say almost, I think almost all modern Hindu thinking has been how to think of conversion in a religious and theological framework, given that we don't have a tradition which actually can easily understand that concept, right? Okay. Now, I don't want to go into the theology of conversion at the moment, Right? We, can, we can have this dis in, 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 in discussion. But the fundamental anxiety is that when you have a religious tradition or a, or a way of life, whatever you want to might co call it for, for these purposes at the mo moment, I and mean, I know there are interesting political distinctions to be made between religion and way of life and so forth, but for this purpose it doesn't matter, that when a religion, tradition, or way of life that doesn't have a history of conversion in the conventional theological sense, encounters religions, Islam, Christianity, that fundamentally do have that tradition, 
right? Where, in a sense, becoming part of that tradition is to convert by some ascent, act of ascent, some act of conversion, right? Their argument is that, in a sense, this encounter is an asymmetric encounter because on this view, the Hindu tradition in that sense is engaged this is encountered with one hand behind its back, so to speak, right? Tied behind its back, right? Because conversion can only be out. Conversion can't actually be, it's not even clear what conversion in would mean, right? Now, the reason I'm calling this a demographic anxiety, not a theological, religious anxiety, I mean, there's, there's that dimension to it, which, which in a sense we can discuss later, right? Is because this anxiety is really just an anxiety at the base about the number of adherents of the Hindu tradition that would remain in case the supposed project of Islam and Christianity to convert and gain more and more adherents were to succeed, right? Okay. And this anxiety is very widely shared. I mean, one of the, one of the things to, 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 to notice about this anxiety, this is not party political specific. This is not just an invention of the BJP or not just an invention of the Hindu right. It is something that has actually even codified in our Indian constitutional law. Right? Whereas, well, you know, in the Constitution, there was a big debate over the right to proselytize. Right? Uh, like good Indians, we finally fudged on this right, which is we say you have a right to propagate, but not a right to propagate with an aim to convert. Right? Now, uh, how anybody can figure out the distinction, you know, which is why this is such a terrible law, actually, by the way. Right? And this was law enacted by Congress, Congress governments, right? Right? So, but, 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 but underlying it, underlying it, right? Because on a straight freedom of religion argument, look, everybody should have the right to pro pro propagate so long as they're not interfering with the rights of others, how people choose their, to define their identities, whether or not they have the way, you know, wherewithal to name themselves as anything they want, anything they like, right? But just think of the political consensus that lies behind the argument that somehow proselytism of some kind must be regulated, right? Because this proselytism is a kind of asymmetric exercise, right? And the consequence of this proselytism, why does this matter? Not because it might have theological or religious consequences, right? Okay. But because it certainly has demo demographic consequences. Yeah. The second sense in which that anxiety, political anxiety, and you know, believe me, it all does lead up to Kosambi at some point, I'll explain in a minute. The second aspect of that demographic anxiety is around the issue of political representation. Now, in order to see this point, you just bear with me for a couple of minutes and kind of I'll give you a short take on my, my, my take on the history of partition, right? Uh, post-1857, when it became clear that in the modern world, the only likely form of legitimate government is going to be some form of democracy, right? The question of demography instantly becomes an important question, right? Because democracy is about a game of numbers, right? Right? Uh, Sayyid Ahmed Khan, as early as 1857, right? Right after the 1857 revolt, quoting chapter 16, John Stuart Mill on representative government, saying, look, democracy cannot work in ethnically divided societies where there are permanent majorities and permanent minorities, right? One of the first things to notice here is that the creation of the idea of a majority and the creation of an idea of a minority is itself a product of a concern with democracy. Prior to the introduction of political democracy, major the idea of majority and minority in this sense did not make any political sense. Right? Yeah. Now, 
So Sayyid Ahmed Khan lays down the, this gauntlet. And one way of reading the history, I'm oversimplifying this, but from 1857 to 1947, is the history of failed negotiations over? What is an adequate form of representation right, that can guarantee the interests of the minority and be a bulwark against majoritarian domination? Now, the challenge, you might think this is a very simple question. Most societies have not been able to solve this question quite <laughs> as, at least without violence and bloodshed. The challenge in formulating this question was the following. So one option, right, as a political project would have been to say, look, this is, you might say, the American option. Just go the way of American constitutionalism in its idealized form, not the constitution of 1776 with the Southern Compromise. But you just say, one person, one vote, basic protection of constitutional rights to everybody, free speech, expression, assembly, so on and so forth, right? Well, what's the problem? Right? There'll be no permanent majorities, there'll be no permanent minorities. What rights you have do not depend upon what religious identity you have, right? depend upon your rights as individuals. You know, life would be perfectly fine. Right? Now, one of the interesting ironies of Indian intellectual history, and Kosambi does remark on this somewhere, is that this position, which you might say would be a classically liberal position elsewhere, in India came to be seen as the anti-minority position. Why did it come to be seen as the anti-minority position? Because you could ask the question, okay, you're saying we'll get these constitutional rights, they'll be enshrined in a constitution. You're saying one person, one vote. But who is going to administer this constitution? How will the power that this constitution is administered by be constituted? Right? And then you might say, well, naturally, in a majority country with majority Hindus, don't you think Hindu wills will be administering this constitution? Right? Therefore, minorities need safeguards. Right? Well, what would those safeguards be? Right? One possible answer is a share in power. Okay? Then you say, what is an adequate share in power that would be sufficient to right? guarantee minority rights and interests? Right? Jinnah comes and says, only if they have veto over a number of issues. Well, okay, if you have veto over a number of issues, is that compatible with a modern project of common citizenship? Right? Now, there's a complicated history, but you can see that the core point, in fact, one of the things about, in all the discussions in 1947, you know, if you look at it just through the political reading, is there was never a stable answer to the question, what would be fair terms of representation? that would allow you to solve this problem. As I said, the American solution is out. Anything that deviates from that one person, one vote, you say, look, give minorities more weightage. What was Jinnah asking, right, at, at a certain point, um, before 1947? Uh, equal share in power, right? That risk provoking a backlash from the right, which is actually you're giving minorities more rights than their numbers warrant. You're giving more power than the demographic counting of numbers would warrant. Right? So Indian democracy in that sense, right? And 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 the painful birth of Indian democracy during partition, right? Is born out of that deep sense of failure that the question of representation remained a completely unresolved question. Right? Now, if you look at what the contemporary Hindu right does, even though the question of representation has been completely off the agenda for a long time, right? after partition, we decided no separate electorates. After partition, the whole question of minority representation was taken off the agenda. Right? For the Hindu right, this question still remains politically the most important question. Uh, to use 
you know a, a narrative amit shah has given just as a kind of example but 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 there he's making a political point which is says look yes it's true minorities may not have been given representation you know in 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 informal terms but we created a set of systems and structures where minorities had veto over a number of issues the political project of hindutva is to basically make the transition from saying we should go from a society where the minorities had veto over a certain number of issues to a society where minorities become irrelevant to almost all issues that's the project of marginalization of minorities right so even though the question of representation hasn't come up in formal terms right you cannot understand the dynamics of the hindutva project unless you see in it unless you understand that underlying it right is that sort of in a sense claim that right only if minorities are marginalized then can you know what their conception of equalities can emerge right and the third aspect of the demographic anxiety right which is the political one which again goes back to the 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 you know the 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 idea that uh, in modern societies right once you move away from segmented and hierarchical forms of toleration to forms of toleration where people mix with each other you all go to same college together presumably will date each other at some point something right the possibility of what ambedkar called endosmosis right different communities percolating into each other right that possibility becomes a much more live possibility right what is love jihad about right what is this suspicion of interfaith marriages about right again underlying that is a fundamental demographic anxiety right now so there's one strand of the current crisis you might say of hindu nationalism right which is which 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 arises out of the ascendancy of a certain form of demographic thinking right uh, which is front and center and the thing about this demographic thinking is completely self fulfilling this is not about an empirical argument right you can see how self fulfilling its logic is right this anxiety is paralleled by a intellectual anxiety and that's the anxiety i want to turn to and bring bring in a sense kind of kosambi in okay. now overlaid on this political anxiety as i said is a is an intellectual anxiety and this intellectual anxiety has to do with the worry about the ascendancy of marxism by marxism i don't mean marx's ideas per se right necessarily in that form or in the form that kosambi used it in constructing a scientific history i mean marxism in the sense that i just argued karpatra identified it right which is the idea that history is an ensemble of some form of material forces can be reduced to it right which is what makes it available for scientific investigation but one consequence of history being made available in this way for scientific investigation is that the entire intellectual past of india right becomes more or less irrelevant for understanding our modern predicament it becomes irrelevant for two reasons one because that ensemble itself cannot be understood as anything other than right the application of material power to history and therefore by implication right it has only force at the particular moment that it is actually applied right now in kosambi's own work this tension is deeply deeply pronounced i mean one of the striking things reading about kosambi i i i frankly autobiograph biographically puzzled about kosambi uh one of kosambi's great contributions to sanskrit literature was producing the first modern editions of bhartrihari 
and this anthology of Vidyakar's poetry, right? I mean, just the stunning pieces of philology in some ways, right? And Kosambi, as Sheldon Pollock has pointed out, was one of the pioneers in thinking about bringing the philological method to bear on the study of Indian texts, right? So first of all, this kind of whole enterprise of constructing authentic texts, right? I mean, this entire cottage industry that has sort of, you know, that has kind of consumed early work of Sanskrit studies, you know, the critical edition of the Mahabharata, the critical edition of Bhartri Hari, right? Uh, comparing different manuscripts, finding out the core recensions, right? Fundamentally, that, that enterprise is in some senses kind of philological, and, and, and Kosambi was one of the true pioneers of that enterprise, right? This idea of even a critical tradition, uh, sorry, a critical edition, right? And yet, when you read Kosambi's own gloss on Bhartri Hari, right? As, by the way, is true of Kosambi's gloss on, I think, any aspect of the Indian intellectual tradition, right? Ultimately, you get the sense that for Kosambi, these ideas, these texts, this entire cultural ensemble, right? can be simply reduced to one question, which is what was the function of this cultural ensemble in sustaining and producing particular relations of power, right? Uh, when Kosambi reads the Bhagavad Gita, for instance, right? And actually his reading of the Gita is a little more subtler than his reading of Bhartriri. And as I said, the puzzle to me is, you know, you spent your lifetime excavating, right? A text like Bhartri Hari's, um, uh, uh, you know, corpus, uh, but in a sense have no deep sympathy, right, with any of the things that would might want want might uh, want to make us read it, right? Its aesthetic qualities, its its literary qualities, right? Uh, Bhagavad Gita, for example, right? just to take another example of Kosambi's reading of this kind. Uh, he just slightly says, but Bhagavad Gita has got to be a text of feudalism, right? Why is Bhagavad Gita a text, a product of feudalism? Because Bhagavad Gita opens, paves the way up, right? For a reading of the Bhakti tradition, right? Bhakti, right? Functionally has got to be a function of a feudal society, right? Not just because this is a kind of ethos of submission, right? I mean, that's his psychological reading is actually that reductive when it comes to the Bhagavad Gita, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sometimes. But it's also reflective of the fact, right, that no other agency is possible in thinking about the world other than the, you know, something like a personal devotional submission, right? I mean, in, in that sense, the entire kind of artifice of bhakti, right? You might say, while it's a revolt of a certain kind, it's ultimately a revolt in the service of a certain form of submission, right? Okay. Now you can see, I mean, you, you know, where where kind of one can one, one can in a sense go with uh, 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 this line of inquiry, right? The net result of the kind of Kosambi kind of investigation into Indian intellectual history, right? And, and you might say its, it's, it's effect continues in the way we often do Indian intellectual history, was to first of all raise the question of historicity, right? Each thing for its own time and not for anything else, for the most part. Uh, and that's fairly consistent with Marxian premises, right? Ideas are the function of their time. Ideas are the function of the material relations of production that constitute them, right? Yeah. So it introduces this idea of that the purpose of a scientific history is in some senses a kind of philological excavation that allows us to see not just the text in its time, right? But reduce it to its time in some ways, right? And one of the things that I think makes Kosambi great, even if you ultimately disagree with his method, right, 
is that he really did open up our way to saying, okay, what is the relationship between the texts and the world in which they were produced? Right? I, I mean, I, I would not want to minimize that contribution of, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, that, 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 that Kosambi made uh, by taking that methodological story, right? But that story, right, leaves open the question, not just leaves open the question, you might say just radically transform the question of what, if anything, can and should these texts mean to us, right? We know what these texts do at the level of function, right? And in Kosambi, it was very clear what these texts do at the level of function is reproduce and legitimize certain relationships of power, right? Okay. Does Bhartriyari do that? Sure. I mean, it is a reflection of a power. Kosambi was exactly right. This is not a democratic text in the sense that we would actually understand, uh, uh, you know, that term, right? Okay. But if Kosambi is right, if Kosambi is right, right? It generates this paradox. On the one hand, to understand the Indian past, you have to excavate it in the way Kosambi did. On the other hand, what's the point of this excavation? Other than of it being of historical interest, an interest for historians, right? And you can, you, you can in a sense see why historians are in the eye of the storm kind of currently. Now the same kind of anxiety that Kosambi generates, because the question that Kosambi asks you is, and I, I, I don't think modern Hindu thought has an answer to this yet, is, you know, what is the worth of this tradition over and above and beyond its time? Now you overlay one more version of this materialist argument, and you can begin to see why the political stakes in this move are so big. The overlay comes from none other than, of course, Ambedkar, right? Ambedkar, as you very, I mean, you know, was also in some senses, and it's actually interesting to compare Ambedkar's readings and his textual excavations with Kosambi's, right? But Ambedkar also fundamentally was operating in the same territory, but in a deeper sense than Kosambi did. Right. Kosambi was more functional, caste is class. Ambedkar was taking the view at the same time, right? And this is the single biggest challenge to the Indian intellectual tradition ever posed, right? It's not just that the Indian intellectual tradition legitimizes relationships of inequality. Okay? That proposition is not only not surprising, it's a proposition you would actually, easily, you know, most of us would easily accept, right? In Ambedkar's method, philological method in that excavation, there is the much more radical claim. The radical claim is that all that entire cognitive apparatus, that cultural production, right, is permeated by caste through and through. And just to see the radical nature of this claim, just, just think of a contrast, right? Uh, it is true in all cultures, even in that their, their, their greatest thinkers sometimes end up legitimizing relations of inequality. You know, Locke is an investor in a slave company. Uh, you know, Kant has interestingly racist kind of views, uh, right? So when we engage with those traditions, right? The kind of move we often make is to see the connection between the forms of hierarchy they are legitimizing and the basic structure of the argument and thought as a contingent one. So you might say, yes, Kant was perhaps racist at the margins, but that does not affect the validity of the arguments in the critique of pure reason, right? It's a contingent relationship, the relationship between the social structures of power you're legitimating and the cognitive world you're creating, right? Yeah. Ambedkar's claim, right, was that that relationship is not contingent, 
which is what you cannot do is detach arguments about drum logic arguments about pretty much anything actually right from the fact that they are products of a cognitive makeup that is fundamentally hierarchical and if you want to dismantle that hierarchy you have to dismantle that entire tradition in cognitive makeup right so it's not it's it's not like saying simply saying you know what shankar may have legitimize certain relationships of inequality let's just put those aside right let's get on with our exegesis of the brahm sutra and find some truth about the relationship between self and brahm or something like that the radical claim was that that cultural inexperience of inequality actually exhausts the meaning of all that that intellectual tradition contains right uh to put it in very glib terms everything is casteized right yeah. but ambedkar shares with kosambi the underlying assumption right that it's very hard to see these texts right as representing anything other than an ensemble of material forces to be fair to ambedkar he did not just that think that about the indian intellectual tradition i mean there's this really moving exchange i mean uh, uh, i think it's one of the most poignant thing ambedkar writes um, it's the dedication to uh, his book what gandhi and untouchables did to congress um, it's to a long time friend of his in england uh, they have a huge correspondent i mean uh, in fact one of the great one of the great things in ambedkar scholarship would be to recover that correspondence uh, she was a secretary in the house of uh, commons so this book is dedicated to f it's just dedicated to f okay uh, and the dedication begins by saying you and i were discussing the book book of ruth which is the book in the bible right um and you had an interpretation of the book of ruth i'm afraid i can't go on along with this interpretation because fundamentally right for ambedkar the book of ruth also has to be read through the relations of subordination and domination that it is actually crafting right now you take all of this together and you can see what the crisis of hindu intellectual inquiry is right because put this way the matter leave the the choice you seem to face is either you subscribe to a world view even if though even if you attenuate it performatively even if you say i don't believe in caste right either you subscribe to a world view whose entire cognitive structure is shot through caste through and through right that's choice number 1 right or you simply have to say as which was the conclusion ambedkar came to which is i think the conclusion kosambi came to right which is you just have to jettison the whole thing right okay there is no way you can have right? the richness of that tradition without it somehow being getting implicated in the question of caste over and over and over again and i think the crisis of modern indian intellectual inquiry hindu inquiry actually comes from this basic premise okay um now what is the way out of this i mean how you know how do we read kind of kosambi and ambedkar and i just want to just kind of spend 5 minutes and then i'll kind of close as a kind of possible way out let's bring in another figure to juxtapose with kosambi i just brought in ambedkar who's kind of on kosambi side with some complication but on kosambi side uh, uh, at least in this fundamental premise the figure i'm going to introduce may surprise you in this context um, but i don't think it's surprising right this arbindo ghosh right now you might think okay here's finally a modern indian thinker who doesn't share kosambi's premises who doesn't share ambedkar's premises right uh 
it's probably the most elaborately thought out attempt in the 20th century to rethink Indian traditions, philosophically, metaphysically, ontologically. Why not? Why did it not work? Right? Why is that not an answer to Kosambi? Okay. Now, two things about reading Aurobindo at this point, and and I want to kind of share them, which is Aurobindo was probably the last great serious intellectual attempt to come to terms with this question of tradition, as Kosambi and Ambedkar put it. And by Aurobindo's own admission, it's a near complete failure. Okay? And that's, that's the ruins on which then the politics of Hindu nationalism gets built. Why is it a complete failure? So for Aurobindo, the reconstruction or the possibility of engaging with Indian intellectual history, right, fundamentally depends on three moves. If you can make, make these three moves, you can recoup that Hindu tradition for modern times. If you can't make these moves, you can't recoup it, right? So the first move is the revolt against Shankar. In fact, again, I'd be a little bit flippant, but you might say almost all modern Hindu thought is a revolt against Shankar, right? It's a revolt against Shankar on three different dimensions. First, it's a revolt against Shankar's interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita, right? which basically says that, look, contemplation is the highest form of existence. Okay? Everybody from Tilak to Aurobindo to Gandhi is trying to rewrite Bhagavad Gita 214 to say that that passive interpretation, I mean, using passive, in, you know, uh, again, within quotes, that passive interpretation of Bhagavad Gita is not an action is the highest form of life. Okay? That's one move. The second move is a critique of Shankar's Mayavad, right? Which is the idea that the phenomenal world, with all its particularity, diversity, difference, and its contingency, right? That simply is not, that's not simply a site of, as it were, illusion, right? That even its subsumption in the divine whole has to, in a sense, honor the particularity and individuality and differentiation. And Arbindo's entire over is trying to actually work through this paradox of how can the transcendent actually become imminent in the particularities of history, right? And the reason Arbindo thinks this move is important because if you don't make this move, right? then the only place that Indian intellectual traditions can find in modern India is, 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 is as a realm of kind of, you might say, mystical escapism, right? What Peter Sloterdijk, um, uh, the German philosopher, once described India as the planetary granary of spiritual narcissism, right? Uh, he wasn't denying the reality of spiritual life, not, not the reality of mystical life, but fundamentally it was a form of self-absorption. Right? Yeah. And Arbindo himself argues, I think in the cycle of human humanity, I think the punchline is, actually you can't make this move. And by the way, this is, I mean, just as a footnote, not just a problem for Hinduism. Iqbal comes to exactly the same problematic in his reading of Islam. Uh, Iqbal's rewriting his critique of Sufi metaphysics is that the problem with Sufi, Sufi metaph metaphysics is that it affirms the reality of the divine at the expense of the particularity and creativity of history, right? The divine becomes accessible to you by escaping from history, right? Not, in a sense, in and through it. And, and that's Iqbal's parallel project at the same time. Okay? The third and final move that Aurobindo thinks you need to make Right? And, and this relates directly to Kosambi's argument, is to ask the question, in what form can a Hindu religiosity be available to us, right? in a way that's authentic and, 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 and meaningful and intellectually vibrant? 
And here, I think Aurobindo's answer will surprise you. <laughs> okay, and then this is this is uh, it surprised me certainly, and it took me years to. I, I still don't fully understand it, but it took me years to figure out uh, at least some of what was going on. To put it very reductively, Arbindo asked the question, in what form would a genuine religiosity be available to us? If it were genuine, right? Okay. And he says, look, there's three or four forms in which it's traditionally available. The first is, if the social order itself is a manifestation of that divine cosmic order, right? Okay. Arbindo is very categorical. That is no longer available to us. If it ever were, one of the interesting things about Aurobindo's commentary on the Rig Veda uh, and his remarks on the Rig Veda is the point of that commentary is how inaccessible the Vedas are to us. Precisely because the Vedic as it were, mode of constituting society is exactly that all social relationships right, are symbolic manifestations of that larger religious order. Right? Apart from the fact that from whose point of view, that would be Ambedkar's question, Kosambi's question, right? Is this just simply ideology run lit? But even if you put that question aside, right? Aurobindo very quickly comes to the conclusion that that is simply not an option in the modern world. The social will always confront you as something of an alien entity, right? that cannot be endowed with significance in religious or cosmic terms. Okay? Second option is the medium of law, right? So the social structure is not a reflection of the divine, but you simply follow some form of divine law, right? Shariat would be a good example. Uh, uh, maybe some version of Dharmshas. Arbindo is very clear that that form of apprehending religiosity is a kind of petrification of the individual spirit because it honors, in a sense, law in its external coercive aspect. It doesn't have an inwardness and individuality to it. Right? It's, I mean, it's it's it, you know, it's 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 like living in like a legal positivist jungle, right? Without understanding what the meaning of that law is. Third option, and this was this is interesting. This is where. Aurobindo and kind of Kosambi come to divergent rules. He argues, look, possibly bhakti. Aurobindo argues that bhakti movement should be seen, like Kosambi, as actually a rupture in Indian history. It's a rupture in Indian history because the need for it arises only because those traditional forms of religiosity are no longer available. So the only space in which religiosity can be available is some kind of, you know, sense of private self, inner self, right? But its meaning comes entirely from that subjective identification. It cannot be objectified in any social institutions, right? And it's interesting to see Kosambi and Ambedkar actually converging on this point, seeing bhakti as a kind of break with the creation of a genuinely religious society, right? But the difference between them is that Aurobindo sees in the Bhakti movement and Bhakti the possibility that there is something greater in the self more than the its determination by material forces, right? There is some kind of a kind of subjectivity that overflows simply the relations of power that constitute the self, right? But what do you do with it? You can't actually do anything in some sense with it. The fourth and final mode, which would be available to you, uh, you might say is, you know, and this is a term he uses a lot, Vivekanand uses a lot, is experience, right? That's the, that's the thrust of the essay, Yoga and its objects. That's the thrust of life divine. Right? Is there a form of practice that can actually put you in touch with, right? Whatever that transcendent divinity is. 
And again, here, Aurobindo is actually surprising. He's surprising because on the one hand, he doesn't want to deny that possibility. And obviously, he himself experiences it, claims it, writes about it, right? And, and, and the entire kind of yogic practice is, in a sense, leading up, uh, leading up to it. But he thinks that that is deeply problematic. It's deeply problematic for two reasons. One, because it doesn't get over the spiritual narcissism problem, right? Which is, once you have identified, once, once the self has dissolved in the presence of this larger divinity, let's for a moment assume that possibility, right? The relationship between that self and the historical embodied self still remains a problematic one. You're back to that problem of mysticism that you actually, in a sense, kind of started out in the first place. But more importantly, and I think for a scientific institution, I think more interestingly, uh, Aurobindo has this profound sense that he tries hard to make the argument that this is a practice that could be made available to all, right? This is a practice that could lead to the collective evolution of mankind, right? That's, that's, a, that's a strange move in Indian intellectual history, but let's say try that. But he has this profound sense, right, that not only is this practice not going to be made available to all, cannot be made available to all, are the cultural conditions under which this practice can be understood, are those cultural conditions ever going to return, right? If you look at the contemporary debate over yoga, right, just kind of ending up. I think, and, and, and the contemporary debates over Indian philosophy, different schools of Indian philosophy, Hindu philosophy, one of the reasons there's a kind of anti-intellectual quality to them, right, is, I think, one way to explaining this is to think of the analogy. Suppose you've got a bunch of philosophy of science texts, right? Let's say, you know, Alistair McIntyre asks you to imagine a kind of a cultural revolt, like the Luddites and the anti-intellectuals and the right-wingers and all of these people take over and start destroying intellectual life, dismantling universities, all kinds of things begin to happen, right? And then a few fragments survive, and the fragments that survive are your philosophy of science texts, right? But people have lost a sense of what the conception of the practice of science looks like, right? In the context of which these meta debates about the philosophy of science made sense, right? Okay? So you could have a debate about realism, anti realism, and science, but you actually have no sense of what the practice of science is actually like. Aurobindo had this profound sense that Indian culture was in that point where we can have a lot of these meta debates. There are these texts, right? They are arguing Nai, Vaisheshik, Buddhist, Vedantin, Advait, all, I mean, you know, incredible body of kind of scholarship being produced, right? And they seem to make sense, but their reference are no longer clear, right? It is trying to, in some senses, reconstruct that practice, right? from these fragments of a kind of meta text where the institutions and cultures that actually made those practices intelligible no longer exist, right? And in that sense, the centrality of yoga, I mean, of course, yoga makes sense as a, you know, as a self-perfection exercise, its medical benefits, all of that. But, 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 but those are, you might say, modern techniques of perfection of the self, right? But yoga in its core spiritual form, right, which is in a sense access to Aam Brahmasmi in, some, in a reductive sense, that's a practice that no longer in a sense makes sense, right? And so in a surprising way, Aurobindo ends up, right, leaving exactly the same vacuum that Kusambi left you with. Kosambi was happy with this vacuum because it allowed the possibility of reduction, right? Let's just get on with it, you know. 
<laughs> all this Bhartiyari stuff, it's great. It's great as historians, it's great as philologists. You know, it changes our conception of time, history, all of that. But ultimately, this is just about the phenomenal world, right? Ambedkar leaves you with this position, right? Odd kind of position of saying that whole edifice has to be taken down if there is going to be the possibility of political emancipation of any kind. And then there's Ambedkar's position, uh, sorry, Arbindra's position finally, which is while arguing that, right, the cognitive content of these texts has a validity in its own right, right? Nevertheless, coming to get the conclusion that the cultural conditions under which that cognitive validity can make any sense to us no longer exist. The Vedas literally are inaccessible to us, right? as would increasingly become texts of yoga and so forth. I mean, a lot of people claim to write about them, talk about them, right? But there are moves in this kind of meta game, right? Which is why, let's say, the debate between Buddhists and, you know, followers of Shankar now would not make the sense in the same way that it might have done in the 11th and 12th century. Uh, I mean, Amartya Sen likes to uh, argue that, you know, we are argumentative Indians. Uh, we argue a lot, uh, but it's not particularly clear, right, what the stakes in that argument are in those traditions. And even Amartya's own work, trying to recoup this history of argumentation, right, is really about saying, what I like about it is the fact that we argued. But we actually don't like anything that we argued about, right? right? So we are actually in this kind of you might say an intellectual vacuum, where on the one hand, modern Hindu identity in its political form is racked by that demographic anxiety with its own self-fulfilling logic. On the other hand, in its intellectual form, right, where partly it has felt the pressure of colonialism to say, look, and it's true that colonialism subjugated traditional forms of knowledge, colonialism destroyed a large number of intellectual edifices. Nevertheless, right, it is unable to articulate what would it mean to recoup these forms of knowledge in forms that made persuasive sense, right? The way we often explain that is by exteriorizing it. It must be because there was a colonial conspiracy. It must be because philologists from Columbia and Harvard are all besotted by Kosambi and they've all become Marxists and tell us all Hindu tradition is relations of power. There's nothing else to it, right? The obvious repost to that is the following. Uh, think of the vast ensemble of cultural institutions in India, right? Think of the Shankaracharya's Marts, right? Uh, I mean, since we are in Karnataka, we can talk about Shingeri, we can talk about Udupi, right? What is it about those locations? They have the resources, they have the texts, they have people with linguistic knowledge, they even have the basic Shraddha, which is a stake, right? in not just preserving these forms of not, but doing things with it, right? Why is it that almost all those places have actually, are, are intellectually become moribund, right? It's a rehearsal of old truisms, in some senses, right? Dead truisms, right? So, this exteriorization, right? And look, I, I, I think at this point, we, we, sh we should consider ourselves post-colonial enough to stop blaming colonialism for everything, right? This exteriorization has become, in a sense, an easy psychological recompense for the fact that every single Indian modern thinker, right, with the, with the exception of Gandhi, in a, but, but Gandhi is in a very different case, right? Uh, and I think of Kosambi at one end of the spectrum, or Bindu Ghosh at the other end of the spectrum, right? All collectively announcing 
that the Hindu intellectual tradition cannot be reconstructed at the level of meaning and practice in the modern world. And my worry is that now, I guess the two, you can take two pathways out of this. You can take Kasambi's pathway, you can take Ambedkar's pathway and, bat, and bite the bullet and say, look, this is a debate for historians, philologists, let them get on with it. Modern India has a political project defined by our constitution. Let's just get on with it. Whatever crumbles in its way crumbles. That's, that's one way out, right? Uh, and certainly, I think politically, probably the only plausible way out, right? But I think we will have to more honestly confront, more honestly confront the anxiety that the exhaustion of tradition is producing in its adher adherence, right? Because whenever a culture, you know, arrives at a sense of its own, you might say, intellectual impotence, right? It's the moment it's also more likely to be aggressive and outward blaming. To end with this quote, Hazari Prasad Vedi, right? Again, somebody like Arbindo tries to reconstruct this tradition in a very different way. One of the great writers in Hindi, right? And probably did more too. His last closing thought was, you know, he spent all his life reconstructing texts, writing brilliant historical novels. But he has this wonderful small essay called Jab Dil Bhara Ho or Dimaag Khali Ho. When the heart is full and the mind is empty. And you know the existential pathos of this essay? It begins by asking this question, which is, if this tradition really was organically vibrant and had that potential, why is it that India is in this state today? Right? We do not have an interest in these Shastras, right? Not because we don't intellectually understand, they have a lot of incredible stuff in them. But the underlying cultural motivation that makes us think about what these Shastras do for us, if we were to honestly ask that question, we find it very hard to come up with an answer. Right? And that was, he didn't say, we, he didn't mean that, you know, Dimak literally khali, Dimak in the sense that our heart is full of that anxiety. Right? But our mind intellectually, in our intellectual honest moments, confronts the possibility that we can't do much with this. And that was the challenge Kosambi was posing to Indian history. Right? That's how radical he was. It wasn't just the fact that he's a Marxist. Right? And that's the challenge that in our cultural politics, in the politics of the humanities, in the politics of our universities, uh, in the politics of intellectual patronage, I think we are yet to come to terms with. Thank you. Up for that brilliant talk. Questions? I guess there will be, I guess you won't mind yeah, yeah, fielding sure. questions. <clears throat> Uh, so, thanks for these nice talks. I wanted to know that, for example, if you take some other country than India, say, which also has ancient tradition, like say China or some other countries. So, what is the difference between Indian thought and Chinese thought? Or do they also feel same kind of anxiety about themselves? Because as far as I know, there is no radicalization of their past or something. There may be some, but it is not a strong political force in their country. And maybe same is true for other countries. So what is so particular about Hinduism and India? That's a really excellent question. Uh, we should probably do a three-day seminar on this. Uh, I, I think it has a brief answer, uh, or at least one way I, I think about this question. I mean, it's, it's in, in thinking of comparative humanities, thought about this a little bit. So one, I think, to be fair, what I call the demographic anxiety is a feature of a lot of nationalist politics all over the world. I mean, you could argue some interpretations, I mean, it depends how you read Amer the data in American politics. You could argue that even in contemporary American politics, there's the kind of 
you know, white anxiety about, you know, a certain kind of power slipping away, right? But I think there are two or three, I think, key differences, I think, which are worth thinking about. And I've been thinking about it in the context of universities. And, you know, particularly even at Ashoka, we, we are having these kind of discussions about, you know, what would it mean to introduce more Indian elements into the curriculum? I mean, what does that actually mean, other than just assigning, you know, a few texts here and there? So I think two or three things that, that, that in a sense, different, right? Uh, one, you could argue that at least in a lot of dominant Western universities, the process of that transition, right, whereby, let's say, Christian debates, Christian ideas, you know, a certain kind of Christian sensibility gets recast in available secular philosophical terms. That process was long and seamless. I mean, I, it's, it's not an accident, I mean, you know, our favorite thinkers like Kant and so forth, they are, they are Christian thinkers as well, right? And in a way, the, the continuity and transition of that university structure, right? Now, I mean, there's a kind of interesting thing where, you know, the professor of divinity at Cambridge can go from kind of Newton to, you know, so, so, you know to, to like a modern secular thinker, right? Uh, I mean, Newton, of course, himself was a deeply, deeply religious thinker. But that, the continuity of that conversation and spaces was a lot more seamless. I think the one thing I think that did happen in India because of those ruptures of colonial history partly, right, is that the bifurcation between these two streams, where you had the kind of modern progressive university, the ones that the Kosambis and the Romila Thapars and, you know, kind of want to create, right? Essentially, at their core, remain Marxist in this sense. That's the paramount question. And the question of adequacy and meaning was either just ignored or just left to, it's, it's up to people to decide, you know, as scholars, we don't actually engage with that stuff, right? Right? I mean, it's an interesting counterfactual, right? I mean, just to use the examples that I used, which is, if the Shingeri Muts with their incredible wealth had made the transition like Oxford and Cambridge did, or Princeton did, or I mean, all American universities were religious universities, right? Where, you know, in a sense, both kinds of inquiries could be, in a sense, conducted, right? Would the Indian intellectual history of modern India have been very different? And would the political argument around it have been very, very different? I mean, I, I, just to give you a really kind of facetious example, but, but, but in a sense, it illustrates the point. You know, in Delhi University, there was this controversy over removing an essay by Ramanujan. Uh, A.K. Ramanujan has this essay, Many Ramayans, and at some point, ABBV wanted that essay removed from the syllabus. Uh, partly because it talks about many Ramayans, partly because it uses Freud a little bit. Now, of course, I mean, there are many things about that debate that were ghastly. You know, why do we have a syllabus at all at the graduate level? What does even a syllabus mean, right? But one thing nobody pointed out in that debate, that this is a university where you can actually read a Freud-inspired essay on many Ramayans, but you actually don't read either the Ramayan or Freud, right? I mean, there was, there, there was something so, and, 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 and part of what makes that move possible is in, a, is in a sense, if you have the conclusion to the intellectual inquiry that you are engaged in, you've already kind of arrived at right, in this kind of, you know, materialistic way. So I think one, I think you have to tell these institutional histories are very, very, I think, I think different. And, 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 and I think, you know, it's one of the things I think we need to, in a sense, work more on. Because I think 
those will reveal a lot more than you know simply this kind of uh, you know textual uh, uh, textual arguments but there's a lot more to be said on this but i'll i'll hold back for a minute yeah so i you know i look i i don't know the the chinese uh, stuff well but i think i think there's two things right one you know at one level there's actually a lot of similarity between hindu nationalism and chinese han nationalism right which is the sense of a kind of unbroken the self presentation i'm not saying this is the reality the self presentation of a unbroken unified totality of an ethnic group whose natural territory happens to be this right uh that i think is a is a is 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 in a sense a kind of great sort of you know in a sense kind of commonality i think uh 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 uh, uh you know to 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 this i mean i think there's a, there's more to be said about this compa you know a uh, 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 comparison i think on the intellectual plane look i mean there used to be this enlightenment line about china which uh, take with a pinch of salt was that China was wonderful because it had no religion right that's the reason the voltaires and the leibnitz is of the world loved china right because it it was this enlightenment fantasy of a kind of society that actually run without religion in the sense that they understood the term religion but even if you don't buy that argument i think underlying that idea was this idea that a lot of the intellectual stuff is much more openly subordinate to social needs so the current interest in confucianism in china right uh you could argue is i mean it, the the way it can be made easily compatible with maoism or or or, or marxism is basically by instrumentalizing it right um you know confucianism as this kind of bulwark against corruption right the point about that is that that the measure of that intellectual tradition right is not its autonomous cognitive structure it is simply to what practical social use can i put it now and if i can't put it to some social use i'll turn to i'll turn to something i'll turn to something else right that is something i think the indian tradition has resisted for the most most you know most part that kind of instrumentalization of ideas It's a fantastic talk. Uh, I have a slightly strange question, actually, but uh, let me ask it anyway. So it's about this. Uh, just to take the example of the tradition of yoga, mm. I mean, I think, uh, and I personally also feel that yoga is a wonderful thing, actually, that people the world over practice, and uh, all the other things that go with it, like the idea of meditation, and you know. Uh, how to deal with a complex society and uh, uh, how does the brain interact with a complex society and uh, but uh, somehow these practices were born with all this other package that went in, went it, with it so i've always wondered actually whether uh, these things can be actually separated so i just wanted to know your view on that <laughs> this is a uh, you know so I think I'll, your question is a very important one. I'm not sure I can answer it, but I think I think two quick thoughts on that. See, one is I'm of the view right now that I think when 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 a question of this kind is posed, right, can practice A be separated from practice B? you can take it in a kind of objectivist sense or a subjectivist sense objectivist sense meaning that you can you 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 can say that look there is some objective fact of the matter that these practices can't be detached right and all i can say is i'm not sure how one would arrive at that conclusion i mean i can i i can agree with people who arrive at that conclusion but i'm not you know if somebody says the opposite says no 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 i think you can do this bit and you cannot do this bit it's a, it's a, it's an open thing but but the the 
the deeper sense, I think, um, you know, which which is in a sense the 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 question, which is so. I think the question is: it, to what stage do you want to take the yoga? Right. Uh, I mean, in traditional texts, right. I mean, if you take, let's say. Hari Bhatt's treatise on yoga, which, you know, lists all the different forms of it, the different hierarchies of it. Uh, you might say you can begin with mundane bodily concerns, the kinds of things you're talking about, right? Concentration, meditation, and so forth, right? Uh, I think at that level, there's no, there's in a sense no issue at all, right? I think the issue comes, and, and, and that is in a sense the question, whether you actually believe that in the process of advancing on that ascent, you actually get access to a different ontological reality at all, right? So first of all, that, that itself will be a matter of, of, of belief in the sense that whether you think this is something that's actually accessible to you in a sense or not, right? And, and I think that is the... The, the question, in a sense, Arbindo was struggling was that uh, the paradox of that question is either you have already have experienced it <laughs> to be able to say, I believe it, but, 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 but then that raises the problem, which is why does your experience oblige anybody else, right? So I think you can take the view, which is that even if that were true, right? it actually doesn't solve the problem that in a sense you're posing, which is what obligations actually flow from it. Um, that remains a, a, not only a totally open question, but e even if you look at the terms of the tradition itself, I mean, one of the things I think, one of the reasons I think the tradition sequestered off those who claim to have access of the transcendent from society was because I think they perfectly well understood how dangerous those people can be. Dangerous in the sense that if, if you think you have overcome the ego and you have acquired an illusion of that overcoming but have not actually overcome it, then you are possibly the worst danger to mankind <laughs> that can be represented, right? I mean, a lot of the kind of the, the critique of Tantra and so forth was not about the intrinsic validity of those practices, that, you know, they are probably generating forms of experience and consciousness that have a certain validity, right? But it's one of those things where the stakes are so high that unless you are sure you've got it right, right? The, the, the deformed version of angels is going to be the devil, whereas the deformed version of human beings is still manageable, right? Uh, and, and I think that tension our society actually never resolved. I mean, I think, I think in the early 20th century, there's a lot of attempt to bring it, and, and which is why I think, which is what you see in contemporary politics, right? Which is, I think, I think the whole sort of, not just the tele-evangelization, right, of yogic practices and so forth. But it completely, you know, scares you when anybody claiming any kind of authority of that kind actually enters the social or political realm with, with you know, precisely for that reason. Yeah. Sir, your, uh, your final uh, quote from... Um you know, uh, from Divedi ji was so apt, so to the point, you know, uh, dil bhara and dimag khali seems to be the, you know, situation that we are all seeing around us, you know, even what we ourselves feel. But I want to um, ask, you know, I want to submit to you, is it not a little sort of um, overused this, um, this, you know, contrasting or this counterposing between the Marxist so-called Marxist view versus the, you know, the Hindu view or something like that. I mean, don't you think that this is like a useless stereotype because even what is the Marxist view, even that is now sort of transforming. There may be people who sympathize with Marxist economic, political, economic beliefs, but who do not necessarily hold a anti-Hindu per se view, or anti-Indian intellectual traditions view. So I feel that that 
you know, using this template, um, this lens of Marxist versus Hindu, I feel that that is both overused and I think that's all, that's even actually counterproductive in the present times. I would rather pose a question as follows. If indeed, uh, you know, Indians or people who, Indian people who wish to um, build further on their long intellectual traditions, if they really indeed wish to do that, should they not, on, on the other hand, be asking the question, what are the ethical, social ethical principles or the social ethical aspects of these beliefs and these traditions. Now, for example, I would like to say that in his, when he took on the Hindu religion, Gautama Buddha Siddhartha, he said, he, 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 he uh, argued for the, not just the pursuit of spiritual sort of enlightenment or nirvana, but side by side he emphasized Shila as one of the prerequisites for enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment, navel gazing, narcissism, etc., as you mentioned. The big question between before the Hindu society or the Hindu tradition is what is the Shila that is advised or what is it that we are subscribing to? Because by contrast, the, the Abrahamic religions actually have a definition of Shila, right? And we are trapped in this discussion of caste and so on and so forth, Ambedkar and everything. So, uh, um, and you also mentioned the Bhakti tradition, which was an exemplar of Shila, actually. So, you know, I would want to submit to you, sir, that uh, this question can be, a, you know, this uh, situation that we are now in, which is Dil Bhara, Dima Khali, is a consequence of, I mean, I think all Indian intellectuals have to take some share of the responsibility for this uh, extremely unpleasant predicament that we are currently in. And indeed, if you wish to break out of this, we should give up this, you know, preoccupation with Marxist versus Hindutva and start talking about what is it that we can do today and what do we learn from the intellectuals like um, Didi Kosambi and all the others who were mentioned, who, who uh, you know, strove to find a path forward. I think that is the priority we should think of right now. Sir, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Uh, very big question. Should we collect two or three? It might be easier to... I, I will answer the, the question. I'm just afraid. I, I, it's such a big question that uh, you don't want to... Maybe we'll collect one, a couple more, and then I'll just. I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, so I was thinking that uh, isn't there a lot of different knowledge to make Hindu texts more uh, uh, relevant to, like for example, the love between Radha and Krishna. If you think of it as the uh, love of the heart, heart for the infinite then you, it gains a different meaning. And that's what probably the old Hindu philosophers, that's what probably they meant. So we have to probably bring in those thoughts as well. And that's it. I'll take one more and then answer them together. Excuse me. Yeah. I, oh, okay. So I just wanted to ask uh, probably a pretty vague question. So I just wanted to ask, uh, how does language feature in all this in the sense if ideas weren't considered all that pristine and they're worthy of jettisoning, why are languages so pristine? Like in the sense, given the fact that yeah. all of it actually, I mean, came out through this medium, yeah. how did it survive or should it? So, uh, let, let me take these three questions. Uh, there's so, I, I agree with you. Um, On the second half of what you said, um, you know, which is, look, I mean, we are tie we're tying ourselves in knots in these debates. Uh, we're going to go around in circles, chase wagons. There's a simple, straightforwardly core ethical question we need to answer. And the question we need to ask is, what are the resources we can use to answer those questions and help with those questions? Um, I'm very sympathetic to that view. And, 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 and in fact, I think as, a, as, as, as in order to, I think, create particularly a healthier politics, which is 
concerned with particularly this question about how we relate to each other as citizens, as human beings. I think that's exactly the way to go. You can't hang that argument either on arcane metaphysical debates or on, you know, convoluted historical debates about medieval Indians. There, there, there I'm with you. I think the challenge with doing that, though, and, and I think this is, this is an interesting question about, you know, where does ethical change and ethical reflection come from, right? Uh, I can certainly tell you it almost never comes from universities or professors teaching, saying, teach these texts or, and maybe that's a good thing, actually, I, I you know. Uh, most of those decisive changes, you, you need three or four elements in place together, right? Um, you obviously need creative new intellectual thinking, ideas that people freely and spontaneously respond to, right? But most importantly, you probably need exemplars. I mean, I, I actually think the, the realm of ethics, I mean, this is one thing I think Gandhi got exactly right, which is authority in the ethical field can only in the end be the authority of exemplarity. It can't be any other kind of authority, right? And exemplarity is kind of hard to pluck out of thin air. I mean, you know, which is why professors are so bad at it. It's like, you know, saying let us do ethics is different from saying, are there ethical exemplars that actually spontaneously, you know, that generate the kind of allegiance one do? So, so I think the second project is intellectually easy, but I think practically difficult. On the first question about Marxism and Hinduism, so I, I, I mean, I, I agree with you and I, I understand what you're trying to say. It, it is a very crude contrast. But I think it's helpful to think with this crude contrast for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think as a society and as an academic culture, we will have to learn to live with both sides of the contrast. I mean, I think one of the reasons the humanities and social sciences in India have kind of tied themselves into knots a little bit is because this division between those who think texts are about you might say, let's say, you know, meaning and purpose, and those who think texts are simply artifacts that generate and produce power. That is actually the reality of modern social sciences. And, and, and I, think, I think it is creating a crisis, I think, in, 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 in them, right? So it, 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 it should be possible to be both Kosambi, right? And or, or Bindo in the same university system. Right, which is which is proving very hard to do, by the way. I mean, it's it's so you know and that was the point of the Delhi University example. But I think more deeply philosophically, uh, I think there is, I think, actually a conflict. I mean, con and, and 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 you know, and, and it's not just between kind of Marxism and Hinduism. Marxism is, in the sense that I'm using it. You're right. Marxism has transformed the varieties of Marxism, particularly when you think of its applications to history. Right. But I think in the core question, which is, do you think the self is in the end, in the end, right? With all the complications of Marxism. But the self in the end is a product of those material forces, right? Uh, that kind of remains the ontological core of Marxism and a Marxist theory of the self in some ways, right? Where there can be common ground, where there can be common, I mean, I mean, I, I mean you know, I'm a big fan of Marxist theory of, in a sense, I mean, self-determination, not in the collective sense, but in the, in the, in the, in the, in the individual sense, which is, you know, the, 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 the idea of, right? Uh, a self that has a free, that has freedom to fully create itself, right? Now, right? Uh, 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 that would be a self that would give us a god who could dance, literally, right? In, 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 in you know, in, 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 in some ways. Uh, but I do think in, in their orientation, I, I, I don't want to kind of minimize that tension. Uh, I think the challenge is to see that both can work within the academy, and perhaps it is the duality of human nature that you will feel both sides in a sense of that, you know, in a sense of that argument, which is a relapse into a one-sided idealism is 
you know, intellectually, if you like, as problematic as a relapse into a reductive materialism, right? Uh, I think, I think, I, th I you know, I, I you know, in in some, um, but you know, there, there is that. I mean, Bernard Williams, this philosopher, always used to joke about util utilitarianism that. You know, utilitarians are liberals not because the two doctrines are consistent, but because of the generosity of their sentiments. And, and I'm wondering whether in this reconciliation also, it's more about the generosity of your sentiments than the philosophical reconciliation. Okay. The question about language and, and, and your question about love. You know, the question about language is a very interesting one. Um, if I were writing a political history of Hindu nationalism in North India, I think language would play a very central role in this. Language would play a very central role in this, and, and frankly, if you look at the future, I think it's, it's going to be a big challenge, right? Which is, along with the colonial ruptures of knowledge, which we say destroyed the Sanskrit knowledge systems, or maybe they were already dead by the time colonialism arrived, a language like Hindi is facing a profound political crisis. You know, in South India, it seems that the politics of Hindi is about the imposition of Hindi or making Hindi a national language. Actually, that's not the most interesting political question about Hindi. The most interesting political question about Hindi is, uh, what happens to a language spoken by large numbers of people when it is no longer, so when it is being used widely, People still speak it. In fact, it's kind of gone national thanks to Bollywood and I mean, everybody speaks broken Hindi. It's used widely, but is no longer the site of the production of new forms of knowledge. Right? And one measure of this crisis is if you pick up any Hindi newspaper in North India, 70% of op-eds are sourced from English now. Because nobody writes economics in Hindi, nobody you know, does new international relations in Hindi, all, I mean, I'm just being, right? Forget the sciences, right? Add to this the sociological fact that you have an education system that in large measure is neither producing bilingual people. I mean, I actually think bilingualism is dead, actually, in North India, in the sense that it existed 20 years ago. I mean, we can all speak Hindi. You know, we couldn't lecture in Hindi the same way. I mean, that, that would be the test of a bilingual, right? Large numbers of people educated in that medium and yet not fully, and, but, but who can't fully make the transition to English medium with the full degree of confidence, right? Now think of the double burden on your identity that places, right? And a law now in the south and the east that politics of language was sublimated by the politics of regionalism. So you had Hindi to fight against, so you know there's a Kannada thing, there's a you know, and, and plus because of the, the the sense of regional identification, the gap between the elites and the vernaculars wasn't as stark in Hindi. As, as, as in a sense in North India, right? Where, where, where the one way you distinguish yourself from the masses was by not speaking Hindi, right? Whereas in Bengal, because you had a kind of incipient ethnic Bengali nationalism or Tamil behind it, you ha always have to make that gesture, right? So you have this, you know, North India, the politics of Hindi in this really bizarre double burden, right? Uh, and the way it manifests itself is, well, we'll make Hindi the national language, we'll make, right? I don't think this crisis of Hindi is going to go away. And, and, and it's one of the cultural undercurrents. I mean, if you ask the question, why do these people feel they're marginalized, right? It's actually the thing that they cannot say, which is they're marginalized because of being trapped in a language, right? Which they don't see as moving forward as a medium of knowledge or as a medium of economic access, nevertheless, is still core to their identity. What would you do with that kind of a linguistic identity? Right. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, I'll ask you this. Yeah. Um, thank you for your wonderful lecture. 
Um, regarding the purpose, you said that finally it brings us to one single question as to what is the purpose of all this religion and all these texts. But uh, looking as being a student of science and students seeking truth since a very small age, um, studying the Gita according to a particular interpretation, let's say I'm studying Marxism, so I go by his knowledge, then I get a proper knowledge. Or let's say some book is written in German. I need a person who knows both the German and the book itself and the person who wrote the book and what is his final message to give me the exact message, right? So that brings me to an idea that I must submit to that person who has a particular idea of German, knowing the person and the final message of that particular book, right? So if we take the Gita, you have so many messages like today we face inequality in spite of we have so many ideologies and all of it, and even if you take the Russia being the core of Marxism, we say that people are equal, but you see, for example, an organization like a company where we have different classes of people, like you have a, probably the heading unit, which is planning, which is working out on what needs to be done, what need not be done for the company, what is the future of the company. And if you take the caste system uh, by the Gita, I'm not speaking about what it has become in the modern day world. I'm speaking about how we can actually implement the Gita so that our lives can be improved. So from that point of vision, which I try to do in my life so that I can take something from you today. So if you take the this thing, it says guna and karma, are the two words used, that means nature and quality of work that the person does is the qualification, not birth, which has become in current day India. Of course, I do agree to that. You see this qualification exists in a company. You have the marketing team, which are probably the Vaishyas. You have the laborers, which are the Shudras, and you have the, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, the administrative class, right? So if you take the whole consideration and the whole topic here, I do feel that if we had the right person who could give us this knowledge of the Gita in the modern day English world, Right? What, wouldn't it be possible to implement a better world? Because, of course, submission is there everywhere. I do agree to your point that why must we submit? But thinking back, if I agree to Marx, I am submitting to Marx. If I agree to Freud, then I'm, I'm submitting to Freud. So that put apart. Submission is going to be there everywhere. Don't you think that we can come to a modern day world taking the spirit of the Gita? It is irrelevant. Definitely the text that occurred there could be irrelevant. But if I took the spirit of it, like, I could probably, giving an example, reform the entire educational society if I took the caste system by the spirit, that is by guna and karma. And these examples exist in the Vedic scriptures, if you ask me how. Dronacharya is born to a Brahmana, but he's a Kshatriya uh, leader. So he's a guru of a Kshatriya and he's a fighter and a warrior. So if we took these spirits, don't you think that we would have better understanding and better uh, India rather than just the exact meaning of the words. Because today, like you said, Kosambi, uh, different people, they did not understand or some, some people looked into the depths of it. Now what I feel is, did they actually have a right person to help them out? Did they have a person who knew the, like I had equations. Now a person who's the friend of Kepler or some uh, big scientist who's friendly with him will have a different idea of the equation and probably speak of the emotion of the equation, which is of no use to me because I'm a student of science. And I want to know what the equation means and why that thought came about. That would be of no help to me. So why don't we submit to the right perception is what I'm asking. So wouldn't that help us? So, yeah, actually, uh, so my question is partly in the past and partly in the present and the future. So India is having a special tradition uh, with respect to polity, like uh, Mahabharata, Ramayana, all are there, but even closer to history is uh, Kautilya's Arthashastra. Mm. As well as much closer to us in time is the excellent compendium on polity written by the King Krishnadev Raya Krishnadev. of Telangana. So, uh, with all this like so-called IP that we have in uh, political science, like uh, why couldn't we uh, make our own philosophy parallel to Marxism? And second question is, can our ancient philosophies on politics help us in solving the today's uh, problems? So, hello. Uh, so my question is, if you consider three verticals of uh, uh, endosmosis, the caste system, and the conversion, if you take these three verticals as separates, there are instances where people have converted their religions, but haven't let go of their caste. So, so that has created problems that, uh, that I see. So I need a comment on that, that uh, converting into another religion and then not letting go of caste. 
And the other thing is with endosmosis, uh, because of continuous inbreeding, is there a lack of creativity with individuals just because of inbreeding, which has been rampant in India f for thousands of years? So that those are two. Okay. <laughs> uh, the last one, look, I, I, I mean, you have to have some theory of the relationship between geneticism, creativity, although I, I think the average size of an endogamous group in India is probably larger than most countries. So I suspect it probably is not a huge issue on that, on that front. But um, I think a couple of very important questions were raised and I, you know, I think you very powerfully articulated uh, something. So let me say where I agree with you and where I profoundly disagree with you. Uh, so I think your agreement about submission and, and, and at, at, at one level, I think the, you know, the beginning of all knowledge is Shraddha. You have to have a basic sense of trust. Otherwise it's not right. Uh, and I think your account of what would it take to actually acquire true mastery at these different levels. You'd have to know about the German, as you said, the science. I, th I, 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 th I think, I think your, your hermeneutics of understanding, I think I, I, I fully agree with. I think the question of caste and translation, I think I would not only disagree with, but I would respectfully submit that I think there's a deep danger lurking in what you're saying. And, 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 and just take a, take a minute to explain, which is, so you know, one, I think we have to understand that given India's history of, you know, perfecting, you know, a really vile social system in terms of human hierarchy, whatever it's caused, I'm not even saying whether it's textual or not, but the fact is the net result was that, right? Whatever the, whatever its source is, uh, it may be completely atextual, whatever, but, but that social reality. I think given that history, first of all, I think we have to recognize the fact that most people be very suspicious of any project that tries to modernize caste, tries to justify it, tries to reformulate it, saying this is not the original thing. It is the very idea itself, no matter what its flexibility, what its basis, what its this thing that is that is deeply problematic. And I think one of the reasons I, I, I actually think, you know, th this in a sense, this, this gap is growing even from college campuses 20 years ago. I mean, I think what you see now happening, I think the, the very understandable radicalism of, I think, Dalit politics around intellectual questions, I think comes exactly from this suspicion and very rightly so, right? That because this question immediately goes back to the question of authority. Uh, I would be more radical than, than I, the way I read the Mahabharata is not just say, I mean, if one were to do that hermeneutic reading, it's not just saying, at least the Mahabharata is whole, not, not the passage in the Gita, it's not just saying, you know, there's a functional basis, let's go for gun and all. It's actually a reductio ad absurdum that you could not actually, in a sense, do that because not even the most exemplary will exemplify that goal. So what's the point of calling them Brahman or Kshatriya or anything else, right? That is actually the point of the Mahabharat. I mean, I think the, you know, and, and our tradition from Nilkant to Anand Vardhan to Gandhi reading Mahabharat that way is if you don't think there are any human beings who can have that form of exemplarity in terms of goal, what additionality do you gain by A, calling them that, right? Why do we even need to call anybody Brahman or Kshatri or anything? And more, you know, and, 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 that, and more importantly, I mean, I think, I think that's, 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 that, that's something, you know, I, 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 we can do. I think the, the danger, right, the, which is that, you know, India has a history and still has a continuing reality of people being constantly defined by compulsory identities, which is, and being defined by third persons, right? No matter what we say, no matter what we say, 
our social identities are constituted that way. You know, you can't deny being X caste. You might deny it. I'm not of that caste. You might even say, actually, I don't even deserve to be of that caste. I don't have all the gunas, right? That doesn't actually take away the reality of the fact that you have a certain social standing because of that name, in a sense of self, right? So I think on the caste question, frankly, I mean, I, I'll be very candid. I think on the caste question, that attempt of the nationalist movement to skirt around it, uh, to be ameliorative about it, uh, I think that's just a moral and political disaster. I mean, I, I think on this is one question I really do think we just have to set up and stay with a straight face that that entire vocabulary of differentiation and distinction right, has to collapse. Otherwise, any conception of a modern society where, which is compatible with human dignity is not, in a sense, going to, uh, you know, not, not, you know, not going to, not, not going to emerge. And it makes people deeply, deeply suspicious, right? I think, sorry, I'll st stop there. I think we have to end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. engaging with uh, all of us and uh, before we conclude I'd like to invite Mr. Rodan Narasimha on behalf of the Your presence means a lot, sir. So, no, why you have this wide range mm -hmm. of philosophy to worship the national security. <laughs> <of> the national <laughs> Thank you, Thank so, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your presence meant a lot, sir. Thank you.